Okay, welcome. Welcome to the HAP 2.0 webinar number seven, uh, May 27th, 2021. Um, so I'll just go ahead with the introduction to house rules. I think we already know that we all keep our mute, mute button on while uh, the presenter is presenting and then we'll do a, a 15, or I'm gonna do an opening prayer as well and a Q and A at 11.45. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead. I'll do the, I'm just wondering if I should do the, uh, your introduction first. Nelson, or do you want me to go ahead and do the opening prayer first? As you wish, Isabel. Okay, I, I'm just gonna go ahead while people are logging in at least. Uh, we'll be there. Okay. Um, Chris, did you receive your bun the bundle I sent you? Oh no, you know what? It was late getting sent out. Okay. Uh, oh, no, no, the other Chris. Chris other uh, Chris? Yeah. Okay. Right. I, I hadn't received it, but I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. Okay. It's damp in here, so the smudge is not lighting as good as I'd like it to, but okay, I'll just go ahead. Ani Gichmanitu, Gijamanado, Kapa Mue Pesire Kwe, and Dijnakazum, and Jijak and Dodam, Misanabi and Donjaba, Migwich Creator for letting us walk this earth today. I ask you ask you that we can have a forest that does not need to be chemically sprayed for good growth at the expense of the plants. As we know, the people rely on them as a part of their culture and it is deeply ingrained within their lives and they rely on them for sustenance. We ask that we be given different ways of caring for the trees without bringing harm or upsetting the balance of the ecosystem. Miigwech. And uh, you can go ahead now with the summary, Nelson. Thank you. Thank you very much for your opening prayer, Isabel. So hi, everyone. Again, uh, bienvenue tout le monde. Um, so as you all know, um, we, um, we hold these uh, webinar under the HAP 2.0 initiative. So the HAP or the herbicide alternative program is was initiated almost 10 years ago by uh, Ryan, uh, Dan Tembeck, and uh, collaborators, including the Ontario um, Minister of Forests and many First Nations communities and organization uh, to look at the use of herbicides and forestry and uh, think about alternatives. Um, and we are very uh, happy at Natural Resources Canada to have been invited to uh, to join uh, this initiative, and uh, we are happy to support it uh, through funding uh, provided by uh, different funds, so by the Canadian Wood Fiber Centre and also by the Innovation Fund of Natural Resources Canada and help um, have these uh, webinar going on. So thank you, and I hope you'll enjoy the presentation. Thanks. Myself off mute. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Nelson. Uh, I guess uh, I'll just go ahead and I will uh, oh, introduce, in, sorry, introduce Dr. Chris Edge of the Canadian Forest Service of Natural Resources Canada. And uh, his presentation is direct and indirect ecosystem changes from glyphosate use in Canadian forestry. And I like the way he put the, the cross right through his presentation and uh, crossing out glyphosate use. I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> okay, Chris, you can share your screen. If he's there. Oh, there you are. Okay. I am here. I just, uh, I realized that, there we go. Did, did that work? <laughs> yeah. not, re not really. We are with oh. your presenter mode. Presenter oh, mode. Just like, <laughs> good thing we practiced that, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it happens every time. It's part All of right, the let's fun. try this one more time. This is a relatively embarrassing, to be honest with you. It's okay. It, it happens usually every... How's that? Perfect. Okay. Um, so the friend is going to move... Uh, here we go. 
Uh, so the first thing I want to say is I want to say thank you for for having me present to this group. Uh, I've been sort of a part of it now for well for over a year, and I've learned a lot from the past presentations and from interacting with you. In particular, this site visit it was really eye opening, and and it's contributed to my to my learnings quite a bit. Um, so I'm very pleased to be able to to talk to you today. And, and I hope to continue with this. And I, I also hope to take a more sort of active role uh, going forward in the group. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna be a little bit provocative with my, my talk as well. Um, and it's sort of partially intentional because I, I, from what I've heard from everybody in the group that the, the idea is, and, and I think this is the right, right approach, is to remove the use of, of glyphosate from, from Canadian forestry when in certain circumstances, and a large part of it is for the protection of biodiversity and traditional uses and medicinal uses and food resources and things like that. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that and I'm gonna separate some effects into you know, direct and, and indirect effects. Uh, and I'm gonna sum that up at the end with, I hope a, a perspective that I've had from, from listening and I, I, hope, uh, I hope it works well with what the group is. Um, so I'm just going to define direct and indirect effects to start off with. So a direct effect is a, a cause and effect relationship. And we can really see this as sort of one thing causing an effect on another, right? So you can think of it as if you, if you lift an object up, right? You, you have picked an object up and, and moved that object. And if we look at glyphosate, we would say, well, glyphosate has a direct negative effect on, on plant survival. And that's because glyphosate is a herbicide and it and interrupts a amino acid pathway with the plant. So we have a direct mechanistic explanation of, of how it's affecting plant survival. And if we wanted to mediate that effect, we would remove the cause. So we would remove glyphosate from use and, and that would prevent uh, the plants from dying from, from glyphosate because it's, it's no longer present. And so it's you know, somewhat easy to, to mitigate these direct effects because you can just remove the cause and it, and it goes away. And so in our ideal situation with, with glyphosate or with any forest management activity, uh, we have an application of a herbicide in this case, but it could be civil cultural technique. It has an effect on the target vegetation that we want. Uh, the plant may die or we have an effect occurs. And then if it's a herbicide, we have breakdown of the chemical. So we, we cause something to happen and that's all that happens in the system. Now, re reality is a lot more complicated than that. And so, you know, reality, we have an application can occur, some of that glyphosate may enter the soil, some of it with target vegetation, some of it will end up in a non-target environment. And then we have various effects. And what we're really concerned about, or, or what my research is very concerned about, is these environmental effects from occurring at, at different points. And so we're, when I'm doing this work and we're really looking at what that the, the target effect would occur and then the direct effect would be the direct effect of your action on different pieces of the environment. And this is somewhat of an easy pathway to process, right? If you can have a cause and effect relationship, we can, we can understand it very, very easily. What becomes a little bit trickier though is when we wanna start thinking about indirect effects. And so from an ecology perspective, this would be the impact of one organism on another is mediated by a third organism, right? So there's, we have two things we're concerned about and there's something in the middle that's mediating that effect. And so to make this relevant to, to glyphosate and some work that I've done on amphibians, the hypothesis, the indirect effect would be glyphosate has a negative effect on amphibian abundance because plant abundance is reduced. So if it with plants, we may have an effect on the amphibians, but it may not be a direct toxicological response or direct effect of glyphosate on the amphibians. That effect is mediated through the plants. So the plant abundance is, is the mediator. And indirect effects are, are really difficult to understand because there's tons of different pathways that, that can occur in the system. And so if we say mediated this effect on, on amphibians, and we remove glyphosate, sure, we, we may not have an impact on the vegetation from glyphosate, but that was the desired effect of the, the herbicide, right? Is to, so in forestry sense, it would be to suppress competitive vegetation would be the desired effect. So that indirect pathway still might occur even though glyphosate has been removed from the system if 
a different silvicultural technique is used to remove that vegetation or, or, or suppress the growth of that vegetation. So it gets a little bit tricky to, to separate these two pieces. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about indirect effects using a, a wetland ecosystem as, a, as an example. And, and this is a, a fun talk because I get to talk about some of the work I did you know, many years ago doing, is doing my, my PhD on these wetland ecosystems. And wetland ecosystems are really handy study units to look at both direct and indirect effects because they're these controlled systems. So we know the bounds of that wetland. It's where that water meets the, the soil, right? That's, that's the bound of a wetland. And within that wetland, there is a complex community of plants, benthic invertebrates, amphibians, zooplanktons, and, and a lot more. So we can do things within these systems and, and understand uh, what the cause and effect relationships of both direct and, and indirect effects may be. And when we think about indirect effects a little bit, they become really messy. I sort of mentioned that a bunch of times now. And so if I were to draw out a schematic of you know, all possible interactions within a wetland, and, and this isn't all of them, this is just a, you know, what we can measure relatively easily, you can draw all these direct effects. So glyphosate could say have an effect on wood frog abundance, amphibian species richness, or benthic invertebrate predators, or macrophyte cover, of course. And then all of those pieces can interact with one another as well. In addition to the abiotic surroundings or the abiotic conditions of that of that wetland. So it becomes a bit of a mess to look at indirect effects. And the first piece is always to to look at direct effects. Let's understand these individual arrows first before we try to draw these these larger network diagrams. And so back in 2008 2009, uh, I did my PhD work on an ecosystem study. So we we split 24 natural wetlands in half, uh, and that's a photo of one on the, the bottom right hand corner. So we split them in half with a impermeable plastic barrier and that barrier is buried down into the sediment and then supported with the rebar post. And then applied a glyphosate treatment, so a lower or a high glyphosate treatment to one side of the wetland. And then another combine that with additional with nutrient enrichment. So there's, there's four treatments. Each treatment is applied to one side of a wetland and each treatment is replicated in, in six wetlands. Um, the experiment, we did a forestry and an, an agriculture experiment, but we have a much better data from the agriculture experiment. So that's the one I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, so there was two glyphosate treatments during the year. These are spring applications separated about 28 days apart, which is typical, and two years of application. So the first application was in 2009 and the second application was in, in 2010. And, I, I really want to stress that this is actually so this is an illegal application. This, this wouldn't occur within in natural systems or within forestry because it's, it's illegal to apply glyphosate to a wetland. And then the other piece is that obviously there's a potential for serious harm in this case. And so the only reason you would do an experiment like this is when there is a, a controversy about potential effects within natural systems. And, it, and at the time we did this study, there was a lot of controversy about the effects of glyphosate in, in, in wetland ecosystems. So combine those two things of having a, a controversial system and a strong need to understand something gives you a reason to do this, this type of experiment. And so the first thing we'll touch upon would be the duration of the exposure. So this is how long that potential direct effect could occur. And so if we look at just how long glyphosate is persisting in the water, so these are the, the high and the low treatment, and you can see that the rapid decline, so that the high peak is the, the, day, the day of application, I should say, and then it declines relatively rapidly. Uh, the half-life is about a day in the water, so about every day the concentration declines by, by one half, and that's why you see this sort of curvature line. It's always degrading by a half of what was, what was there present in the past. Um, Glyphosate is basically not detectable in, in these wetlands or was not detectable in these wetlands after about 14 days after application. So that exposure window of where a direct effect could occur is, is relatively short. It's about 14 days. That's when the chemical is present and, and could potentially have, have an effect. And so the first thing to look at for an effect would be what's happening to the plant. So what's happening to our, our macrophyte cover. And we've got two graphs I'm showing you here. Uh, and these are the treatment side minus the control side. So values above, above the line indicate that there's more of something on the treated side. And values below the line indicate that there's less of something on the, the treated side. And so the obvious thing here is when we 
look at species richness, uh, so the graph on the left-hand side, is that there's less plants, there's fewer species on the sides that were treated uh, with glyphosate. So that's the 2009 and, and 2010 when the applications were made. Uh, and then the next year in, in 2011 and 2012, the species richness bounces back up and, and comes back up to, to what was found in the control sites. And it's a similar story for the, the sum of total change in cover. So this is the, the total area of the wetland that, that's covered in plants. So in the two years application in 2009 and 2010, in all of the treatments, you can there's that uh, reduction in total cover so that wetlands are more open, there's, there's less plants present, but it returns in 2011 and 2012. So that system sort of recovers or comes back to the control levels uh, the years after glyphosate was applied. Uh, for our zooplankton communities, it's a really similar story. So those two dashed lines uh, show the, the two dates of, of glyphosate application in these systems. And the, we have a, on the top graph, we have abundance. And in the bottom side, we have richness. Now, the abundance graph is a little more interesting. So we have the two uh, glyphosate applications. And there's not really a big change between the two sides. There'd be a little more abundance of zooplankton on the treated sides at, right after application. But then months after application, we get this boom, or this increase in zooplankton abundance on the treated sides of the wetlands. And this is sort of interesting. It, you know, the presence of glyphosate is only in these systems for about seven to 14 days when it's present. So anything that's months after would likely have to be due to some indirect effect. And, Zooplankton, if you remember the macrophyte cover, we have a reduction in macrophyte cover and plant richness. So the wetlands become more open. So that may be a hint for uh, uh, what's coming later on in the talk, uh, which would be a cause of some of these indirect effects. Similarly, when we look at amphibians, so in this case, we're looking at uh, the abundance of amphibians that were caged. So these are amphibian larvae, tadpoles, caged on the control and treated sides of the wetlands. Percentage survival is about the same on the control and on the treated sides of the wetlands uh, throughout the year. And so that the, the, the x-axis here is days after that first treatment and the arrow denotes the timing of that second application of glyphosate. So survival is declining over time and this is really because amphibian larvae have a, a, a low survival rate naturally in natural wetlands, but there's no difference between the control and the treated side. So we're not really seeing any indication of a, a direct toxicological effect of, of glyphosate on, on amphibian larvae. And really the time point that we were looking for would be immediately after our two applications. So that day four and eight, or that 31 and 35, where you would expect to see that, that toxicological response that, that we're not seeing uh, in this case. So if we take a sort of a summary of what are the direct effects of glyphosate, then we would see that there's a reduction in macrophyte species richness and cover during the years of the applications made, this makes sense. Glyphosate's a herbicide, so it's, it's going to remove these plants. But that recovery occurs about two years after. So when you remove, sorry, the recovery occurs immediately after, and we have two years of good data to show that now. And so it, it appears that it's really only occurring when glyphosate's applied, that wetlands are bouncing back really quickly. There is this short-term effect on zooplankton that's occurring well after application. And there doesn't appear to be any negative effect on, on amphibian survival uh, directly associated with, with the herbicide application. Now, I showed you this, this slide earlier on. And you know, if we look at those, each one of those individual arrows, so coming from glyphosate, so glyphosate going to wood frog abundance, to amphibian richness, or benthic invertebrates, or, or to macrophytes, we can say, okay, well, we can understand those arrows now, right, on their own. So we know that it's likely the only major effect that we're gonna see from directly associated with glyphosate use is the effect of glyphosate on macrophyte cover on the plants. And that's because glyphosate's that herbicide. But what about all of the other things? So what happens when you reduce plants within the system? Do we see changes in the rest of the community? Uh, and what are the importance of our abiotic factors? So the depth of the wetlands, the surface area of the wetlands, the how many nutrients are in these wetlands? Like what, are the, what are the relative importance of these different factors uh, within these systems? And so I pulled this together a couple of years ago, taking all of the original data that was collected by a, a series of PhD students and did what's known as a path analysis on, the, on, the analysis, on these, these data together. And when we look at the results of path analyses, they're, they're kind of complicated and messy to understand. And this is why. 
So each one of these arrows, the red means a negative effect, the blue means a positive effect. Uh, solid arrows are statistically significant, dashed arrows are not, and the width of the arrow is the corresponds to the importance of that factor. So the wider the arrow, the more important it is. Now, the big take home from this is that there's a lot of interactions going on and it's a bit of a mess. Um, now, when we look at glyphosate, there's that negative arrow going from glyphosate to macrophyte cover. This is what we expect to see because it has a negative effect on plants. But we also see a negative arrow going from glyphosate to wood frog abundance, which I just told you didn't occur, right? I, didn't, I told you that direct effect didn't happen, right? We didn't see that change in survival. So immediately we have to ask now, okay, well, why are we seeing it in one analysis and, and not another analysis, right? So that, that's one question that we have. The other piece would be, okay, can we see, and this is a related question, is can we see the effects of, of glyphosate sort of cascading through these, these ecosystems? And, and we can. So when we look at this cascade of glyphosate, so those direct effects, remember that we didn't see them and we specifically looked directly at them. But if we follow the transition, follow wood frogs backwards. So if we follow wood frogs backwards to macrophyte cover, that big red arrow is indicating that more macrophytes have a negative influence on wood frog abundance, right? And we have a negative arrow flowing from glyphosate to macrophyte cover as well. So that negative arrow is indicating that glyphosate, presence of glyphosate reduces macrophyte cover. And then that in turn has a negative effect on wood frog abundance. So it appears that there's this interaction between removing the macrophytes would then have an effect on, on the wood frog abundance. Now, the other thing I wanna point out about this is that the results of this path analysis probably aren't very strong and robust. And that's because it's the, the, the strength of this analysis is in the number of wetlands that are included in it. And this analysis is limited by the number of wetlands where there's good benthic invertebrate data. So the top has the has these sample sizes there's only five wetlands in this case that have benthic invertebrate data, and that limits the strength of these analyses. So if you remove the benthic invertebrate data wetlands from this analysis and look at just the amphibians only from the 2009, we get a much simpler, much more simple diagram and allows us to look at things in a more simplified effect. And it kind of makes it easier to understand what's happening in the system. So we're still seeing that negative effect of glyphosate on wood frog abundance. And we're still seeing that negative effect of glyphosate on macrophyte cover, but the importance of the effect of macrophytes on wood frog abundance is declining. Now, the other thing that becomes very apparent is what the other influences on macrophyte cover are the minimum depth of the wetland and the surface area of the wetlands. So these are abiotic considerations of, the, of these wetland systems. And when we're making conclusions here, we wanna be looking at the similarities between these two figures. So the highest confidence that we have in these results is that glyphosate has an effect on macrophyte cover, surface area also influences macrophyte cover, and macrophyte cover can have a negative influence on, on wood frog abundance. Now that abundance of wood frogs is also being driven by the minimum depth and the maximum depth of the wetland that's tied to the surface area. And so this is the data from 2009. We can then say, okay, this is what happened in 2009. Let's look forward and say what also happened in 2010 and make similar comparisons to it. So on the left-hand side, we have that same 2009 figure. And on the right-hand side is our 2010 figure. And what we're looking for here are similarities and differences between these two figures. The biggest differences are, is that now wood frog abundance is not really being driven by anything, right? We have all of these uh, non-significant interactions occurring. And the really significant effects that we're seeing are things that are driving macrophyte cover. So glyphosate, surface area of the wetland and minimum depth of the wetland. So these different, these effects of glyphosate on wood frogs, that direct effect is going away. And uh, the direct effect is going away within these systems. So what do we conclude from, from this mess? And I've been sort of rambling on about this for a while and I'm sure you've all been looking at this and, and making up your own conclusions. Well, if I simplify this, you know, even further down within our system, and we just look at what these indirect effects are occurring, the big conclusion from this is that the indirect effect of glyphosate on macrophyte cover in the context of what else is going on in the system 
is larger than that direct effect of glyphosate, and that compensates for that negative effect. So what's happening is the herbicide is changing the macrophyte cover, which is having a positive effect on tadpole abundance and a negative effect on benthic invertebrate presence. But the herbicide itself, and that washes out the effect of the herbicide that could be occurring within these systems. And so the major conclusion from the, these studies was that glyphosate does have a negative effect on macrophytes. There's some evidence for a negative effect on amphibian abundance, but it doesn't occur when we look specifically at that in interaction or that, that direct effect. So it's not quite clear what's happening there. And there does appear to be this indirect mediation through macrophytes. So it appears that it might be more of an ecosystem level change that's occurring within these systems. And when we look at the wetlands, so these are two wetlands that have pretty good photos of, of what happens to them. You can see what I mean here. So like the glyphosate uh, herbicide application really does remove macrophyte cover on the treated side. So on the, the left-hand side, the treated side's on the left, and on the right-hand side, the treated side's on the right. There's, there's very few plants growing uh, on these wetlands. And that's leading to these changes in, in, in other portions of the ecosystem that's happening. So there's not really a direct effect of glyphosate, but there's a change that's occurring through changes within uh, uh, the structure or the function of these ecosystems in some way. So these are the immediate effects of glyphosate. Now, the other piece that may come up when we're thinking about the long-term toxicological effects are what happens after application. So we have an application that occurs that herbicide is applied. And then what happens in a week to a month to two years to three years to four years after, after application. And in this case, it's a little more, uh, even you know, more difficult to study in some ways, but we can take a look at what values that we can measure in nature. So we, the, the concentrations that we can measure in vegetation in our application blocks and compare that to thresholds that are set up for when we would possibly predict, uh, predict negative effects to occur. And the two thresholds that I'm going to use are uh, thresholds that are established by Health Canada. So this is the maximum residue limit or the MRL. Uh, and I'm just gonna define this value because we often see it used when we're talking about the, the presence of chemicals. So the MRL is the upper 95th, percent, 95th confidence interval from measured residue distributions for food for a particular food pesticide combination. So in plain language, what this means is you measure the residue on various food items, you calculate a distribution, and then you take the 95% confidence interval and you say anything above that is a problem. So there's no basis with the MRL to uh, toxicological data. It's entirely based upon a measured residue distribution. And Health Canada sets that value for, for uh, the most protective measure would be uh, one part per million. The acceptable daily intake or the ADI is the maximum mass of a chemical a human could consume on a daily basis for their entire life with no predicted adverse effect. And this value is based on the lowest no observed effect concentration and then divided by a safety factor of 100. So in plain language, what this is, is when chemicals are registered, there's toxicological data collected where animals are exposed to, uh, to compounds and then effects are measured in them. So this lowest no observed effect concentration is the highest concentration that a lab animal has been exposed to at which no effect was observed. So what it's saying is that values below that, we don't see an effect. And then because we're using, or we're using, Health Canada is using data from labor laboratory animals, so in, in most cases, rats or mice, they divide that value by a safety factor of 100 to account for interspecies uh, variation in, in toxicological effects. And so what Health Canada says for this ADI value, which would be the maximum amount that a human could consume every day for their entire life, and we wouldn't predict a negative effect, would be three milligrams of glyphosate per kilogram of body weight per day, right? So a one kilogram animal can consume less than a 100 kilogram animal uh, on a daily basis and, and, and an effect might occur. So the appropriate level for looking at toxicological effects is this acceptable daily intake because it's based upon uh, real world laboratory toxicity data, not the MRL. Now, 
the persistence of glyphosate has been noted in, in vegetation. Uh, so this is some, some work from Lisa Wood out in BC. Uh, and she measured glyphosate and, and AMPA concentration in a variety of uh, 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 species of vegetation uh, for about one year after application. And, and she found that a large number of these values were above that lowest MRL value. So that's this dashed line. This scale is in uh, log parts per billion. So two is actually that 0.1. So values above this line say, okay, we're measuring concentrations that are above that maximum residue limit. Uh, and then very recently, within the last couple of weeks, I think, uh, another study was published by uh, one of Lisa, or Lisa Woods, an author here, and is a, a, one of her co-authors is the lead, looking at the same thing, but looking at vegetation over 12 years after, after application. And so our MRL value here again is down about here. So it's just above the, the zero, right? So this is a uh, micrograms per gram. So it's very low. And so once again, one year after application, some detected values are above that, that MRL. And again, uh, three, six, and 12 years after application, there can be the occasional detection above that, above that MRL value. Although the percentage of detections above that value declines uh, relatively rapidly after, after that one year after application. Now we did a, a similar work out here. So this is some work from, uh, from New Brunswick and Ontario. Uh, so we conducted a, a short-term and a long-term persistence study. The short-term study was conducted in six herbicide blocks uh, and vegetation was collected that's uh, used for deer, moose, and deer and moose browse and for blueberries. And vegetation was collected along transects within an application area and then 25 meters downwind and 50 meters downwind of the, the application area. And these vegetation samples were collected for 18 days after, after application, getting that short-term uh, uh, peeps. Now the long-term study occurred uh, around Sudbury, uh, New Brunswick in, in collaboration with the First Nations there, Wanapate. And in this case, we had two uh, uh, application blocks. So two blocks that received a herbicide application and one control block. And we collected vegetation from each one of these blocks that were important for deer browse, uh, moose browse, and for bear browse. So in large cases, berries. This is blueberries and raspberries uh, for the most part. And this vegetation was collected for, for one year after application. So this gives us both that high resolution short term between zero and 18 days, and that longer term for up to one year, one year after application. The first thing to look at is the, the short term MRL. And so the, the figures here I'm showing you are the A, C, and E. So going down are within block, the 25 meter downwind block, and then the 50 meter downwind block. And then the panel to the right is just zooming in on the, uh, the, the Y axis to provide better resolution because you can see this, the range in values here. So the upper value would be uh, an MRL of 10 and that red line and that lower red line is that MRL of, of 0.1. The big take home piece here is that within the application block, values generally exceed the, the MRL for 18 days after application within the application block. And then when you get 25 meters downwind and 50 meters downwind, we do still see some detections that are uh, above that MRL further downwind, but they're, they're much, much lower overall. Uh, and uh, uh, fewer of the detections are above, above that MRO. <clears throat> in, in the long-term study, it's a very similar case here. So on the, the bottom of the, the y-axis here, we have different vegetation types, and then we have each one of the colors corresponds to the period. So one week, one month, and, and one year after application. You can look at each one of your, your favorite vegetation categories, but, but the real big take-home is that uh, residues exceed that MRL, you know, pretty much all the time, one week after applications, and in some cases, one month application, one month after application, but they start to fall below. And then one year after application, the only two values that exceed that MRL are raspberry root and raspberry leaf. And that's indicating both that glyphosate can be stored by plants, and as well, it can be transported to, to new tissues one, one year after application. Now, I spent a little bit of time talking about the difference between the MRL and the ADI. And the really important piece is that the MRL is a regulatory threshold that isn't based on toxicology. 
it's the ADI or the acceptable daily intake that, that is based on toxicological information where we would use to predict, predict effects. So in order to calculate a, an acceptable daily intake or an ADI, we have to make some assumptions. So the first thing we have to do is assume how big animals are. Uh, so the first thing we'll assume is that uh, a deer, an average adult deer weighs 50 kilograms, an average adult moose weighs 300 kilograms, and a black bear weighs 150 kilograms. We're gonna assume that each one of these species only consumes vegetation from uh, blocks that received a herbicide application. So that's all they eat. All the vegetation they eat comes from uh, blocks that received a herbicide application. That all vegetation within these herbicide application blocks contains the maximum concentration that we detected at a particular time period. And the animal consumes the physiological maximum amount of food they can every day. And so this would be an absolute worst case scenario where animals were eating as much as they can every day they're only eating vegetation that can that is uh, has glyphosate on it, and all of that vegetation has the maximum uh, concentration that we we detected. And so when we look at that over time, what becomes apparent is that for up to 18 days after application, it is possible for each one of these animals to exceed that acceptable daily intake for 18 days after application, and then after up to 18 days, that that goes away. So one month after application it's not really possible for animals to exceed that acceptable daily intake. Um, and now the other way to look at this is to say, okay, well, these are the ADIs that I calculated. Well, why don't we calculate the amount of vegetation that an animal would need to consume in order to exceed the ADI at say one month when I'm telling you that it would be safe for animals to, to eat that vegetation. And so to exceed the ADI, a, a 50 kilogram deer would need to consume about 20 kilograms of uh, 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 vegetation one month after application. A 300 kilogram moose would need to consume 120 uh, kilograms of veg. And uh, a bear would need to consume 214 kilograms of berries every day. So this probably isn't uh, possible uh, for the animals to, to eat that much vegetation every day. Uh, to exceed that, that ADI. And so the conclusion that we would draw from this is that there's a, a window of risk, that risk for animals that is about 18 days after application. And then after that, the risk of a direct effect of glyphosate is, is gone. And because that, can, that window of application, that window of risk is so short, it's not really that risky, right? It's a very short window that would occur. And so when we ask this question of, is there a direct effect of glyphosate use on non-target species? I, I think the answer that we're getting from, from the work that I've presented today, and then as well as the other work that's been done out there that I, that I haven't mentioned is that the answer of that direct toxicological effect from you know, typical forestry applications is, is probably no. That there really isn't a direct toxicological effect of glyphosate on, on different wildlife species. And that's coming from, the work that we've done in Ontario and New Brunswick, and I say we is that the work that I've been involved in, but also a, a large amount of other work that's been done in, in a series of wetlands uh, throughout Canada and throughout the US and, and some work that's coming out of Europe as well. Now, the other question of, is there an indirect effect of glyphosate use on non-target species? I think the answer here is yes. This is really true. So glyphosate use is altering ecosystems and there is a chance for that to have an indirect effect on, on non-target species. And we see this with the wetland work where the removal of vegetation can lead to possible changes in the amphibian communities and the zooplankton communities and the benthic invertebrate communities. And as well, we see this in you know, any forestry plot that I'm sure Ramona of us, sorry, that many of us have been into that has received a glyphosate application where the vegetation is dead or changed, like that community changes. And that is likely to have effect on, on non-target species. And so I can show this with a quick overhead map of those, those spray blocks and the no spray blocks from the Sudbury region. So this is the year after application and you can see the two spray blocks on the lower left across from the road, seeing that basically gray. So showing a lot of dead vegetation compared to that on the no spray uh, block on the uh, 
would be the, uh, the upper right-hand side of that, that road. And the reason why you see that striping and the spray areas is because it's the flight lines of the plane. So as the plane's flying, you get these striped areas where they don't receive a, a full application of glyphosate. And so the, the big take home, I think, from this work, and, and this is where I'm gonna be a little bit provocative and, and push uh, the group is that if you know our concerns are around, and these are valid concerns around possible non-target effects on, on wildlife species, on the abundance of food or changes in habitat quality uh, or habitat amount, and that type of thing that, that, our, that wildlife depends on, we really have to ask is what we replace glyphosate with, will it have those same indirect effects or can we do a better job, right? And so the push I think here is that, yeah, if it, the goal is to remove glyphosate use from, from forestry, but let's make sure that what we replace it with does a better job than the past work and takes it forward into a case where forests are managed in a ways that, in, that, that, uh, that include all the different values that, that we have of our forests and to ensure that happens. Let's not just replace something with something else without understanding that what we're doing is actually going to achieve achieve the goals that that we want to have. Okay, excuse me, Chris. I just want to let you know you got about three minutes to wrap it up, <laughs> so That's we can have time for a question period. Because I'm done. <laughs> oh, you are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna end with this that provocative statement, uh, and I'm happy to take questions on the past worker or other things. Great. We